Hi, welcome to another episode of youtube.com slash video. It's me, your host, the content creator, and today I'm discussing youtube.com. Have you heard about it? Every time I use this website, I feel like I'm losing my mind. Wow. There it goes. Bye-bye. See you later. I've been struggling with the transition from content consumer to content creator. And for the past few months, I've been overthinking this creator audience platform dynamic. How to make a YouTube video. How the platform operates. What makes a good title and thumbnail. How to utilize the YouTube creator studio. Why does anything exist? Is there meaning to any of this? Why do anything at all? You know, simple stuff. It's a bad habit. The YouTube experience could be better for both creators and audience, but it's not, and that's bad. Stick around to find out why. First, let's go back to the beginning. No, not there. Keep going. There. In the beginning, God created the world. Then God created man. Then man created the algorithm. Part one, God is dead. Hey, 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 whoa, whoa. Have you seen the way people talk about the algorithm? What's the difference at this point? Because the algorithm knows you and loves you and just wants you to be happy. And it works in mysterious ways. Sort of. The YouTube algorithm is a recommendation system that decides which videos get shown to you through the homepage, sidebar suggestions, and search. People usually refer to these two when they speak of the algorithm because most people use home and sidebar to receive their content. Technically, all three function slightly differently as a search bar is like a search bar. But then when you go into the sidebar recommendations, it's like we all know how these algorithms work, right? The YouTube algorithm selects videos for viewers with two goals in mind. Finding the right video for each viewer and enticing them to keep watching more videos to maximize long-term viewer satisfaction until you die. Until you die. Keep watching more videos until you f Using two main categories to personalize recommendations. The first is personalization. No shit. Videos YouTube thinks are relevant to your interests based on your viewing preferences and watch history. Topics you engage with and channels you watch. Do you watch a lot of baking videos? You'll get more baking videos. Video essays? All these people. Music reviews? Here's Kate the Nithai Tano. The second category is video performance, which YouTube measures with various metrics like click-through rate, average view duration, average percentage view, viewer retention, likes, dislikes, comments, engagement. Based on these signals, YouTube goes, Hey, people seem to be enjoying this. So let's show it to more people who might also like this. So the video is shown to an even larger pool of viewers. And then based on their reactions, YouTube's algorithm goes, Meet more, meet more, and adjusts the video impressions accordingly. That way, you only get videos that are good according to YouTube standards and not random crappy videos like Grandma Fixes My Toilet Epic or watch me make out with a stick of butter. Sidebar suggestions factor in these personalized recommendations as well, although it's mostly tailored to the video on screen by grouping in common topics or videos that are often watched together. If you're in the mood for a little Backstreet Boys, your sidebar will show you the meaning of not being lonely by filling it up with nostalgia. Finally, search. It's a search engine. It factors in all the stuff from before, but also relies on keywords from the video's metadata. 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 SEO by Jungler. <laughs> the more you use YouTube, the more it molds your algorithmic profile, persona, persona, recommending content based on videos that have satisfied and engaged you and viewers similar to you. It's not the algorithm, it's your algorithm. He lives in you. YouTube weighs all these factors together in order to deliver the optimum viewing experience for you, the content consumer. So you have a nice fun time on the youtube.com website and want to keep coming back again and again and again and again. If you were paying attention in the last section, congratulations! You're now somewhere in level one of being algorithmically aware, or what I like to call Algorithmic awareness. Level zero is blissful ignorance. Algorithms? What's that? Nani? You're just using the website willy nilly and videos magically appear. You see a pretty thumbnail and go, ooh, shiny, clicking on whatever, searching for whatever, as the algorithm takes you on a wild ride. You don't know how or why videos pop up on your homepage, but whatever, it's content. Eat them up, beat them up, beat them up, beat them up. Wow. Moving into level one, you become aware of what the algorithm is doing. Watch a couple Drew Gooden videos and you'll get more of Drew. And also Danny Gonzalez, Curtis Connor, and whomever else is popular in that genre. I don't know, 
Tony Commentary. Hey, how's it going? I'm Tony. Hey, I'm Tony Commentary. Let's look at this weird TV show, man. I'm not on that part of YouTube. Level one is where you can take command and train your algorithm to make it a more efficient recommendation tool, and direct it to give you more of what you want, and vice versa. Through mastering this level, you can unlock level one YouTube algorithmic ultra instinct where you can see your algorithm making these connections in real time how it tries to push you towards certain kinds of content recognizing which algorithmic sphere of the platform you're living in and predicting who or what will show up on your homepage even if you aren't subscribed to their channels. You can see all the ways YouTubers utilize marketing and what clicking on those videos will do to your homepage. I've had plenty of one night stands with various meme videos on YouTube. And what did I wake up to the next morning? More meme videos. And HPV. This is where we start to bump heads with level two. Awareness of algorithmic awareness, Super Saiyan 2 Electric Boogaloo. At this level, you become aware that all your recommendations are manifestations of your personal opinions and biases, which have been shaped by your relation to the reality algorithm, and that your online experience exists in many little algorithmic bubbles, separate from other people's many algorithmic bubbles. If you want to see this for yourself, you can try going incognito and searching for something random, like Donkey Kong, just to see how an anonymous profile differs from your own. My dad watches YouTube on the TV and I've seen his algorithm. The videos that show up in his recommendations are from creators that I've never seen before, who have hundreds of thousands of views and whose content would never appeal to me. But there it is, oh God. I'm being shown all this content and it's only a fraction of the content. Oh God, we're being fractured and divided into different algorithms. Oh God, I will never be in my father's algorithm. Sad. What's more frightening than knowing what you don't know is not knowing what you don't know. Do you think an algorithm knows you better than you know yourself? Does anyone really know themselves that well? Broadly speaking, moving through these levels just ramps up the self-awareness. It's fine if you're satisfied with the content delivered to your homepage and you don't really care. You do you, boo. However, once you feel that your YouTube experience has become boring or lackluster, you begin to question, is it the quality of the content? Is it the quantity of the content? Is this the way YouTube is set up? Are these the limitations of algorithmically curated content? Or is it just me and my biases getting in the way of discovering something new? How do you find something you don't know you want? Is this, is this burnout? And you're hyper aware of all these factors until you hit level three going outside. You go outside and look at duckies. Okay, so the algorithm both literally and conceptually influences our YouTube experience, but how does this actually manifest in using the website as both a viewer and a creator? What happens? What's good? What's bad? What can be improved? Do we have any suggestions for Miss Wazowski? Please note the algorithm is consistently changing. These are my observations. Your mileage may vary. Let's go to the YouTube homepage. <laughs> Wow. Given what we know about the algorithm, this should make total sense to you logically. As it's filled with types of content and creators you recently engaged with and channels you're subscribed to with a bit of flavor mixed in. Emotionally though, the YouTube homepage feels so damn thirsty for your attention. Hey buddy, here's a bunch of shit related to everything you can possibly be interested in all at the same time. Do you want this video or this video or this video or this video? Please pay attention to me. Do you want this video? Do you want this video? Or how about this? Video. How about all these videos? And it shoves an overwhelming mess of content into your face, hoping something will stick. Because the algorithm loves you, it wants you to be happy. That's the thing though, more times than not, this works. If you serve up a hundred videos and I only engage with one, that single video can branch off into more content from that channel or topic. And before you know it, you're four hours deep into a video essay about an obscure early 2000s childhood TV show that you've never heard of before. Peak YouTube Nirvana is discovering a new creator who then blossoms into your next parasocial relationship. We're finding the perfect video, right place, right time. This totally captures how I'm feeling. Thank you very much, content person. Most of the time, however, the YouTube homepage is just it's too much and kind of pointless. Typically, if I'm looking for uploads from channels I'm subscribed to, I go to subscriptions or, you know, 
their channels. I get that the homepage provides easier immediate access to the content and additional impressions for that creator, but it'd be nice if you could have a dedicated subscriptions recommended tab or how about a pop-out window that you can cycle through additional video suggestions from that creator for a quick and efficient glance at their content. Speaking of these tabs, YouTube will give you random categories that you have no control over based on what it thinks you like, but some of these categories are useless. Here's where I would put the live streams if I had them. Them. Where are all the good live streams? Looking for them is a pain in the ass because YouTube only gives you a couple categories like gaming, live now, sports, in this dinky playlist menu. On Twitch, you can browse by categories and subcategories, filtering things out and getting recommendations within categories. That's literally how I find creators there. With these homepage tabs, it'd be cool if I could browse some of these suggestions and look within different interests, which is much better than the current way of getting recommended a completely random category for no reason that I have no interest in. YouTube also has this weird habit of ignoring when you click not interested on a video. If the content is popular enough or you click on something within algorithmic striking range, YouTube says, I will pretend to ignore that. And there it is, again. You kind of have to do this because if you don't, YouTube will show you the same videos over and over and over and over. Even though you didn't click on the video the first dozen times it was shown to you, for some reason the algorithm turns into Daft Punk. Are you trying to create enough familiarity until I succumb to peer pressure and give in? Because even if I finish the video, the algorithm will throw that bad boy right back on the pile and go, Hey, you, you want to watch this again? And I say, Nope. And wonder aloud whether I'm lowering another creator's click-through rate. Yep feels like this is by design. YouTube, this, this this website, YouTube, YouTube makes it harder to remove videos from your algorithm than it is to keep scrolling and clicking. That's easy. There are a half dozen videos I'm not interested in. I can't mass delete them. You have to go on each video and click the little thing and go through these options. Click again. I just want to have like a hover X or more broadly, the ability to customize what happens when I hover over the thumbnail. Taking that extra step to manage your watch history is a hassle. And as I say, those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Mr. Beast, the new to you tab is about as close to classic YouTube as it gets, showing different content from creators that you might be interested in. However, even these recommendations come from your personalized algorithmic persona. And there's the rub. Every tab and every recommendation has been fine tuned to give you what you want. And maybe you're tired of the same old, same old. Maybe you like to spice things up a bit, broaden your horizons, get out of that comfort zone. But how? The algorithm, doesn't really do that. Genuine variety of the strange and niche kind won't come through because the algorithm doesn't know me like that. Who do you think I am? A dynamic human being? Pshh. You ever notice how all these recommendations are coming from larger channels or highly viewed videos that have proven themselves in this algorithmic landscape? What kind of message is this sending to creators trying to make content on this platform? More on that later. YouTube makes it damn near impossible to find smaller creators through its recommendation system. This is where I would put the smaller creators if I could find them. <laughs> Even Twitch.tv with its abysmal discoverability recommends smaller communities. YouTube search is okay. However, you need to have a specific area in mind because these pre-selected filters don't help much. I can't look for videos based on channel size. And if I want to look for channels, it's just a big list of creator names from all the channels within that niche. People are lazy. I'm lazy. If you can use the algorithm as a tool, I want more customization with that tool to discover new channels. Like imagine if YouTube gave you the ability to filter down and look for similar content, combining more features that you get with search with your homepage algorithm. Custom filtering through algorithmic finagling. Maybe I'm looking for a weird 20 to 30 minute video from a channel with less than 1000 subscribers. Yeah, okay, sure. The smaller channels usually don't have the riz, but let, let me be the judge of that. I want to find the diamonds in the rough. Kind of like Jafar, not the actual one. Star Kids one. If I believe in wishes, if I can find the key. With infinite suggestions from a multitude of interests, 
all these videos end up looking the same to me. And I suffer from choice paralysis. It's too much. On Reddit, you can categorize your interests by subscribing to different subreddits. It'd be great if I could categorize my personal interests in those tabs. Maybe it'd be cool if I could customize a lot of these features. What features would make YouTube a cool and better experience for you? Comment down below. The alternative title to this section was, Why is FD Signifier my algorithm? Because I'd be getting all the good shit from videos recommended on his community page. This is indicative of the larger issue. All the cool videos I discover on YouTube come from outside of my YouTube algorithm. Perhaps sharing your algorithm could be a neat little feature where you temporarily borrow another user's algorithmic profile to see what kind of content they get recommended. Think of it like sharing wages, leftist cred. Maybe we could all come together in algorithmic harmony and I could discover whether my experience of YouTube has been the same as everyone else or if I'm doing it wrong. Wrong, sir. Wrong. Now what happens if you want to create the content? Oh boy. Let's make one thing clear. There isn't that much separating me from you. For the vast majority of this site's existence, I've been in your shoes. I'm you. You're much more attractive though. I mean, damn. That's why the shift from content consumer to content creator has been so fascinating for me. As a creator, we have to understand these algorithmic factors because we're trying to get into your algorithm. Platform design, content packaging, optimization. These will influence how you conceive of the video, structure the video, the frequency in which you make videos, etc, etc. If none of that was the case, why do other creators suggest coming up with good titles and thumbnails before making the actual video? Why are there so many videos talking about the title and thumbnail? Why is the marketing of the video so important? Why does the marketing of the video matters so much. These factors are so interwoven that it'd be incredibly naive to say, well, sorry, your video performed poorly because it was bad content. And the audience is always correct because they know exactly what they want. Just make good content. Duh. And what better way to help you improve your content and reach a larger audience? Why, holy shit, it's the YouTube Creator Studio. The YouTube Studio is the home for creators. You can manage your presence, grow your channel, interact with your audience, and make money all in one place. But also, the YouTube Creator Studio is a demon designed to sap your self-esteem as a creator and ruin your will to live. As a viewer, when you're presented a video, this is what you see. The title and thumbnail are the most prominent things. Then views, upload date, channel name, description, video length. There's none to judge the quality of said video outside of the information presented to you. So a high view count and a high subscriber count might give you the impression that, hey, that's pretty good. Because big numbers are how we measure value. The YouTube Creator Studio, on the other hand, does this neat little trick where it freaking tears up, uh, giving you more information than you'll ever need and making you question every single creative decision by telling you that you'll never be good enough. This will be your latest obsession. They call it analytics. You may have the best performing video in terms of views, but the YouTube Creator Studio goes, your click through rate on this video is lower than your previous upload. Viewers are only watching 20% of the video. Here's a little line to show you where people got bored of you and left. Hey, your content isn't performing as well as it did last month. Uh oh, your subscriber count seems to be stagnating. You aren't converting many of these viewers into long-term subscribers. Let's drop your impressions off a cliff. <laughs> views don't tell the whole story. YouTube supposedly removed the dislike bar to prevent dislike attacks, but all this data just makes me dislike myself. Also, I can still see the dislikes. Bruh. Hey, 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 hey. Why don't you remove the goddamn top 10 video rankings list? What's the point of this? Yeah, fireworks are cool when you get a number one ranked video, but what kind of precedent is this setting? If you make enough videos, they won't all be bangers. A video's performance can vary drastically depending on the time frame. The average view duration can depend on how long the video is. Why does YouTube only show views to the audience, whereas I'm subjected to all these metrics? Okay, so like, okay. So like, if I make a 40 minute video that has an average view duration of 12 minutes, does that mean that people watch the video four times? Or does it factor in people who clicked off after three minutes? What if they accidentally clicked off the video or watched it over a few days? Are larger view counts on longer videos is merely content inflation. All these data points create a gamification effect for your video creation process. Within the content itself, you feel as though you have to optimize every single morsel of screen time. Otherwise, your video performance will tank. Don't get me wrong, 
There's a craft to making moving pictures with audio. But obsessing over these metrics can drain the life out of you and cause a creator to lose focus and forget why they want to make videos in the first place. It's tough to divorce your analytical, oh, it's just data, be objective, huh, from your personal feelings about something you made. Watching the line go up feels amazing. Although that high only lasts for so long until the inevitable emotional come down. After every video or numeric milestone, more data points are unlocked and you can break down down traffic sources, who is watching your videos, where they're from, and what they had for breakfast this morning. It's crazy. So much of this data is useless to me at best and soul crushing at worst, which is unfortunate because a YouTube Creator Studio can be a great tool for managing your channel, your content, and responding to comments. So here's an idea, YouTube. Can we customize the studio dashboard to show only the information we want to see? Top 10 video ranking, get out of here. Get out of here. I only like using the YouTube studio to respond to comments, your comments, but the comments are way down here. And by the time I get there, you've already reminded me, oops, you aren't getting enough subscribers. I'm the YouTube studio. Such a good impersonation. <laughs> like strangely enough, one of the better features of the YouTube studio is showing you videos or creators that your audience is watching, ironically being better than your actual algorithm in terms of recommendations. Come on. But even this feature follows a trend where creating content on YouTube feels like marketing 101, baby. You put yourself in the minds of a target demographic and appeal to their cardinal needs, wants, and desires. It's about of viewer satisfaction and providing value to an audience because the customer is always right. Ah. How you title the video is how you market the video and how you market the video is going to depend on who you want to market it to. Designing a good title and thumbnail work on these principles as you're trying to lure in the viewer, arousing their curiosity to get that click without deliberately misleading them with clickbait bullshit. The best titles and thumbnails work together to create that intrigue while also conveying the what and the why behind your video. People are typically attracted to some degree of familiarity, and combining that with your algorithmic knowledge slash awareness is like learning kung fu in the Matrix. Your parasocial bestie didn't just poop out of nowhere. They probably provided an on-ramp to their content by covering a topic you liked, and then over time you fell in love, head over heels for their online persona. It's just like the Matrix. This is also why you see a lot of collaborations, shoutouts, and community building around shared interests and trends because all these creators build each other up algorithmically. Sometimes for good, sometimes for bad. The tools are the same, it's just like the matrix. Simplicity rules the day here. Not sure what to tell the video? Me neither. Lord knows how many tiles I could have come up with for this video. But one thing to remember is that there's a big difference between man talks about YouTube for an hour and a half versus the problem with YouTube. Which one is more clickable and for whom? Beats, beats me. Oh. If you've ever seen creators swap out titles and thumbnails, it's because they're desperately trying to boost video performance. Thanks YouTube Studio, I love you. Why not let creators have the option to create multiple thumbnails and titles that they upload with a video, A-B test them within the system, and then push them out to their respective audiences rather than having the creators constantly worrying about the freaking click-through rate? The whole thing is algorithmically generated anyways. What's another layer to add to that? The AIs are gonna design all the thumbnails eventually. Meet more, meet more. Get Getting the click is the first step, because once the video actually starts, you don't want to bore the audience with boredom. That's boring. They're coming up with zero context and looking for reasons to stop watching and skedaddle to the next video. Forget any long, fancy, detailed introductions. Hook them immediately. Deliver on your title and thumbnail. Tell them exactly what's going on. This is what we're doing. Tease them with what's coming later. Oh my God. Find ways to keep them engaged with jokes and memes. Put a bunch of animated text on the screen. Structure out the video so we know how we're getting from point A to point C. Get to the point. Don't waste their time. Be entertaining. Be informative, make them laugh, make them cry, and don't be afraid to ask for likes or subs or other calls to action because somehow that works. What's your favorite call to action? Comment down below. Take the audience along a spiritual journey that will change them emotionally or intellectually, and be sure to check out this other video for even more of that. Essentially, it's good storytelling. Just get good at making content. Duh. Oh my god! So you made your marvelous piece of highly optimized content and uploaded it to your channel. The fun doesn't stop there. Watch out! Wee woo, wee woo, wee woo. <laughs> it's me, it's the content IP police, and I'm gonna mess up your day. Ha ha ha. What's considered fair use on this site? I don't know. There are no strict guidelines, so 
Good luck, everybody. Creativity is fun because you can do literally anything. Which is why it's even more annoying when YouTube claims parts of the video because you could have done literally anything else. That's what creativity means. That's what creativity means. When I was making the How to Stop Wasting Time Online video, I used a brief snippet of Celine Dion's My Heart Will Go On for a brief gag. Which, okay, fine, it's copyrighted. But why run ads on a 20 plus minute video for using five seconds of media in an arbitrary creative decision that could have been substituted for any number of things? The point of the joke is that Kawhi hit the shot and it was awesome. Yeah! Too late though, the joke was load bearing. So I'd have to go back and painstakingly snip out each syllable of you're here, there's nothing I fear, export it again, re-upload it again, and wait until YouTube gives the green light. I did this multiple times. What's what's the line here? If I sacrifice two seconds, will this please you, oh lord? I live in a society and enjoy making audio and visual references to that society. Ah, uh, just tell me what is or isn't kosher. I can change, baby, believe me. Even when you pass the initial inspection, that still doesn't prevent YouTube from running checks or making claims on your videos in the future. You're pretty much screwed if you get copyright claimed after posting. Yeah, sure, I'll remove the issue with the built-in YouTube editor. Have you tried using the built-in YouTube editor? It stinks, it stinks. Yes, Mr. Sherman, everything stinks. In addition to content ID, sometimes YouTube has weird interpretations of the subject matter where it's not just the monetization that's affected, but also video performance. Certain words and visuals could put age restrictions on your content, which limits its potential reach. So you're rolling the dice every time you say, Fuck. or cover certain issues, or use certain words in your title. Because this website sure does love being as inclusive and as nuanced and as understanding of the context as possible and is smart and is playing the YouTube game comes with the territory. However, the longer you play, the more you realize how the site tries to mold you into what it wants. There is nothing nefarious behind this. It's the system operating as designed. Platform incentivizes creators to optimize their content for various metrics they've deemed indicators of good content and to market said content in an algorithmically focused environment. YouTube primarily makes its money off of advertising. So the longer people engage with content on the site, the more ads they can show. Provided the content is advertiser friendly. So make longer videos. Make a bunch of shorter videos. Make more videos. String them together. Make a playlist. Keep their attention. Money. Keep making more videos. Keep feeding the insatiable content beast. Money. Serve them some ads. Before the video, during the video, after the video, on the video. Ads here, ads there, ads everywhere. Ads everywhere. The internet is one giant advertisement. Ram them down your throat. Money. 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 Oh my god. I'm so horny for money. Wanna break from the ads? Wanna break from the ads? All that matters is engagement and viewer satisfaction. Doesn't matter how it's crafted. The ends justify the means. For the creator, making good content in this context equals more exposure, which snowballs into more profit, more leverage, more clout. Creators make videos to appease an algorithm through their construction, presentation, and topic selection because that's what works. That's how you get attention. The proof is on your homepage. But once you get that attention, get the views, get the exposure, why would you stop doing the thing that brought you success in the first place? If you have a formula that works and rewards you for doing that same thing, why bother doing anything different, interesting, or unique? You've found your niche. YouTube knows what box to put you in. If you branch out, your built-in audience expecting one type of thing may not fuck with this other type of thing. That's if you're fortunate enough to get an audience in the first place. What if the video isn't performing? Is it the title and thumbnail? Is it the content? Who knows? It's not getting those engagement metrics. Something YouTube will constantly remind you of, regardless of whether your audience is half a dozen people or in the hundreds of thousands. So this algorithmically focused environment has effectively put you in this double bind creative mindfuck, where you're going in circles trying to optimize said content for said environment in an attempt to reach whomever might be interested in it, potentially compromising whatever creative vision you had for that video or any video for that matter, all the while wondering, is the content the issue here? Is this what the audience wants? Is this what the algorithm wants? What's up? What's down? It's a real chicken or the egg problem. 
This is the Catch-22 of YouTube. How do you get good engagement metrics? You make good content. Hey YouTube, what is good content? Content that gets good engagement according to these metrics. After all, big numbers are how we determine whether a creator or their content is worth watching. But just because someone can garner and hold your attention, does that make it good? Does that make it valuable? Philosophers throughout the ages have debated the concept of what is good content, and none of them figured it out. What do you think? Leave a comment down below. YouTube is a platform where everyone can have a voice. It's their mission statement. All you need to do is turn on the camera, record something, upload it, and you have the potential to reach the world if you have an internet connection. Good content can come from anyone, anywhere, at any time, so long as people find that piece of content valuable to them. In a way, that's kind of beautiful, but also terrifying. I'm bringing this up because despite what the metrics will tell you, there is no simple formula to making good content on the site. Say it with me, everyone. YouTube is not a meritocracy. Yeah. Whatever skills or abilities that go into content creation are varied and can differ drastically from creator to creator as everyone is looking for different things to get out of their content consuming experience. While of course making videos is a skill that can be improved upon and the baseline for quality improves across the board, the amount of work that goes into making videos won't necessarily correlate to an output as oftentimes people will have different quality thresholds. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. I've seen well edited, well produced bullshit do numbers. I've seen creators saying the most asinine ideas, but oh, they have a lovely speaking voice that resonates so lovely on their sure SM7B. Meanwhile, some low effort stuff comes off as being more authentic and down to earth. Sure, their sound and picture quality aren't the best, but damn, they just seem so cool to vibe with. And it feels like a real person made this instead of a team of editors and a bunch of social media manager people. Cut. Personally, I've always been fascinated with who becomes the guy, the arbiter of opinions, the he, the she, the they, the them, who becomes the them. Take for example, Moist Critical. No say to Charlie, he's fine, he's got the vibes, but why him? He made a bunch of entertaining gaming videos, people liked his persona, he grew an audience, and now he turns on his webcam and millions of people listen to his opinions on whatever's going on that day because he's Moist Critical. Literally just a guy. Meanwhile, a different creator can do months of research, writing, editing, producing, pouring their heart and soul into crafting a video that's pretty good, all things considered, yet barely cracks 10k views because... algorithm. Some other guy takes his duck to Walmart. 3 million views. <laughs> and counting. Low effort, high effort, low quality, high quality, 480p, 4k, might not matter, especially on an online platform like YouTube. If you've ever commented on a video, wow, how does this not have more views? Or I can't believe this channel has less than 100,000 subscribers. Or how do all these channels have less subscribers than this other channel? There you go, the myth of meritocracy. Yeah! This is why building a YouTube channel as a smaller creator feels like being an unpaid intern, surfing a lottery ticket, trying to catch an algorithmic wave. According to this website here, the odds of getting over 100,000 subs are one in 350. There's a lot of luck involved, and anyone who says, well, just make good content. That's what worked for me. Boy, do I have a plane to sell you. For every big Joel, hey everybody. there are many more little hey Joels who got destroyed. The success of your channel could come down to being in the right place at the right time. Basically having your interests aligned with popular sentiments as you fill in some gap in the cultural zeitgeist while feeling fresh or different enough. At the end of the day, you're dealing with human beings and we're kind of ridiculous. We all have biases, we're emotionally driven, we're all influenced by society that places value on having certain attributes and all that plays a role in deciding whom or what you decide to fuck with. It's level two of algorithmic Awareness. This is the conceptual mindfuck that goes on top of the creative mindfuck. YouTube claims that the algorithm is basically the audience, hence it's impartial. All it does is merely reflect what the audience wants, what you want. However, human beings are not static entities. We're all interfacing and adapting to this online digital landscape that YouTube has created. Even Obi-Wan Kenobi understood this. You and the Nabu form a symbiont circle. What happens to one of you will affect the other. You must understand this. We should know Karen. 
about Da Nabu. Users are going to interact with what's presented to them through an algorithmic recommendation system, and creators, understanding that, have to then interact with these algorithmic forces to get their message across, with both sides simultaneously getting feedback from the systems they are participating in with all its incentives, which then influences them going forward in this endless cycle of content creation and consumption. While creators are the lifeblood that drives this digital space, YouTube has made it clear that the content is king. Anyone can make the content. Seems like everyone's making content nowadays. If a creator you enjoy isn't posting, there's another creator just a click away to fill that void. And as a creator, you don't want to be expendable. You don't want to be forgotten. You don't want to lose whatever momentum you have. So keep making the content. If you haven't caught that algorithmic wave yet, just keep making the content. You want to stand out, get noticed, grow your channel, Make good content, just like how everyone else is making good content. Look, I get it. Don't hate the player, hate the game. And yes, hashtag not all content and creators are like this. However, no one is immune to bending to systemic pressures, which is kind of tragic. Trying to cater to an algorithm makes all this content feel too polished, too corporate, too mainstream. When the balance shifts to where getting views or audience retention becomes the primary driver of your content, Something gets lost in translation, and this is the result. Artists are so concerned that an AI will take away their jobs and extinguish the spark of human creativity. Well, the AI is already here, and now I'm stuck staring into an endless content abyss. For this video, I focus mainly on YouTube, but when you consider the internet at large, plus all the media that exists and is going to exist, we're living in an age of seemingly infinite content. Everything everywhere all at once vying for your attention. It's insane. <laughs> Imagine trying to create in this environment. A bet theory about creator burnout is that it has less to do with the actual making of the video itself and more to do with everything surrounding making the video. The frenetic pacing, the uncertainty, the volatility, living up to an audience, dealing with constant criticism and feedback, having to measure up to certain metrics, an algorithm, and your own creativity. Everything, everywhere, all at once. And you're always on the clock because any time spent not making content could be time spent making content. You begin to suffer from a condition known as content brain, where instead of consuming content, you become consumed by content. Either by laser focusing in on an idea for content, or your mind is endlessly contemplating what it can turn into content. If Philip K. Dick were alive today, he'd be writing, do content creators dream of titles and thumbnails? Any thought, any opinion, any thirst trap selfie, you can take it all and toss it out into the digital ether as part of your curated online avatar persona. You can get attention. You can make money from that. You might need money to live. But as you commodify different aspects of yourself through having this online presence, a strange dissociation occurs between yourself and yourself. It's you, but it's not you. As the self becomes merged with the content, those YouTube metrics aren't just an objective look at video performance, it's saying something about you. Am I good enough? Do I matter? How can you measure any personal worth from these metrics, knowing the good fortune that goes into an algorithmic recommendation, or whether or not a bunch of strangers decide to fuck with your shit? You don't have time to rest and reflect, because if you aren't making the content, someone else will. So pick up the pace, be consistent, and keep feeding the insatiable content beast. We are not content machines. We're human after all. But the system is only designed to make you feel as valuable as the last video you put out. You only have value because of the videos you put out. You only have value because of the videos you put out. Shut up Shinji and get in the goddamn Ava. Hashtag all YouTubers are Shinji. If anyone can make the content, why do I have to make the content? Do I have to get in the Ava? Shut up and get in the goddamn Ava, Shinji. So you get back in the Ava. You keep putting in the hours, the mental energy, writing, editing, producing, working so hard to put something out, hitting publish, basking in the completion of what you've done, only to be left staring at a blank canvas with the lingering question of, what now? I've made the content. What now? Make more content. Push the damn Ava up a hill if you have to. 
Sisyphus. Why would anyone want to do this? Reflecting on what it means to be a part of this online ecosystem attention economy has trapped me in my own creator limbo. I genuinely enjoy the video making process, but uploading and posting online makes me feel like I'm participating in a system whose only aim is to suck up your time and attention for profit, clout, power, influence with everyone fighting for a piece of the pie and i don't know if i'm becoming part of the problem expressing yourself is hella cool and wicked awesome but sharing online makes me question how much of this is self-serving cloud seeking attention for attention's sake that contributes to our ever-increasing noise pollution that we've organized and maintained this bizarre hierarchy of status and clout makes sense i guess yet is also questionable because the foundation of that is human beings. People are a bunch of goofy, emotional, silly beans. And I know this because I am a people. Sometimes I like being a silly bean who posts dumb, irrelevant nonsense. That self-awareness makes content creation very difficult for me. As the content creator, I have to frame this creation in a way that provides value to you. Otherwise, why would you watch it? I know if I cut off a bunch of words talking about my experiences or any mention of myself, I in the first person, you can put yourselves in the narrative because it's not about me. You don't care about me. This is a transaction. You only care about me insofar as I'm a vessel that provides emotional validation through entertainment and information, or you just like looking at my face. You give the people what they want or what you think they want. Does anybody know what they want? Oh no. Years ago, I discovered that the trick to getting karma on Reddit was getting early to a thread and typing up a comment that jive with popular opinion. Just hop in and say what everyone is thinking. Does, does anyone like Brendan Fraser? I do. Let up dudes for you, my good sir. That's how Redditors actually talk. <laughs> you can get real Machiavellian by observing how others respond and react to certain phenomenon and then giving them what they want to hear, even if you don't actually care. It doesn't matter if you're repeating the same memes, the same talking points, or even if they've heard it a thousand times before. Whatever it takes for karma, for views, for attention in this game, of human psychology, understanding the marketing, tapping into people's emotions, etc. Because all the incentives are there. We monetize every aspect of the human experience. It's business. Ooh, it's business. It's business time. Oh, oh, oh. When you observe human behavior and all the systems we've created, falling into cynicism is easy. You see the trending topics, the buzzwords, the goddamn YouTube soy face thumbnails, the clickbaity titles, the calls to action, the endless pumping out of content to build a bingeable catalog so an algorithm will promote it more favorably, and all the YouTube tips and tricks to help them do that. Bah. No wonder all of YouTube looks like this. Just give the people what they want. Give YouTube what they want. Aren't you horny for money, success, and validation? Look at Mr. Breast. Oh no. Alright, let's huddle it, let's huddle it in. Real talk. Cynicism is a self-defeating attitude that gets you nowhere. Because what are you gonna do about it? Everything sucks and is bad. We're all motivated by self-interest. That's just the way it is. Okay, thanks, thanks dog. You can hide behind, I'm a rational big boy who sees the world for how it truly is. All day. But for me, much of this disillusionment is rooted in fear. Shocker. Jedi Master Yoda knew that fear is the mind killer. Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. I, I'm suffering. <laughs> Welcome to WatchMojo.com, and today we're counting down all the doubts that go into content creation or being alive. Starting with number one, the fear of failure. As someone who makes art, internally you don't know if you can live up to your lofty creative ambitions. Everything you produce is disappointing, and you're afraid all this effort into making YouTube videos will be pointless. If giant stinky pants over there can get over 200,000 subscribers with their ice cream review channel, and everyone seems to love their videos, what does it say about you? 
and your output. You yearn to become a full-time content creator, but those dreams might be crushed under the brutal reality that people don't really fuck with your shit. Putting yourself out there will end up hurting you in some way, so avoid it at all costs. What happens if real life gets in the way and you don't have the time, energy, or resources to build your channel or hone your craft to make better content? Maybe you could have gone somewhere if you had the emotional and financial support that Johnny Stinky Pants does, or maybe you did, and you're just bad at it. Or worse, you're mid. As fun as it is to watch creators on the rise, sometimes their ascension into YouTube glory stagnates, and they're left in the D-tier list of mid-range to small content creators. You're decent enough, but not good enough by YouTube standards to make any sort of headwind with your creative endeavors. Stuck in a state of content purgatory, this is where many creators fizzle out and vanish, never to be heard from again. They gave it a go, and oh no, what a blow to their ego faux show. This would definitely lie. No matter what you achieve, you'll always be adjusting to your relative level of success. I've seen this happen with larger creators like Nick Green over here, where he talks about a previous video of his not doing so hot. And I'm sitting here thinking, dude, it has so many views. When I had 100 subscribers, I thought, gee, I wonder what it would be like to have over 1,000 subscribers. And then I zoomed past 3,000 and had a video hit over 20,000 views. It felt good for like a day. Responding to all your comments was cool, if not a bit overwhelming. <laughs> and there's slight relief when the growth slows down. But once the dust settles and the notifications chill out, I'm left staring at this new number with a sinking feeling in my psyche. Oh, I guess that's what it is now. Oh. Okay. Meanwhile, monetization is always lingering in the periphery, especially if you're putting a ton of effort into this YouTube experience. Get the money. You deserve it. America. However, there's a fear of what that means for the creation process. Monetization doesn't ruin your passions, but it does change how you view them. What begins as a creative outlet away from the regular grind turns into another avenue to compare time to money. Because who wouldn't want to monetize every single aspect of their existence and turn everything into a hustle? There's pressure to get the bag now because you don't know how sustainable this content creation thing can be. Do you run ads or take sponsors to support yourself financially at the expense of audience immersion? Do you keep burning the midnight oil to release videos because you have a quota? What if it's your primary source of income and you live in a country that doesn't provide affordable healthcare? Money Trees is the perfect place for shade, but a dollar might just make that lane switch. That's just how I feel. America. There's a fear of missing out if you're not taking advantage of every single opportunity that comes your way. Am I fucking up my algorithmic momentum by not putting out more content? Or am I right where I need to be? Should I be posting more on social media? Networking with other creators? Building and promoting my brand? I'm shy. I should be working harder. There are people less fortunate than me. I'm limiting my full potential. But what happens if I blow past every milestone I set out to accomplish? Reach the top of Content Mountain and it still doesn't fill the emptiness inside of me. You're burning yourself out on the chance that you might make it. And even if you do, it won't solve your problems. How messed up is that? But let's say you do it. You grow the channel, you get the viewers, you get above the algorithmic poverty line. You find some emotional fulfillment in what you do. You're achieving some definition of success. You're getting all the maidens. <laughs> How does that kind of success change a person? Success can be a poison. You have to be careful about not being trapped by your ego and not believing too much of your own bullshit. If you get to the top, why question the system that put you in that position of authority? Who would say no to millions of followers being able to spout out your opinions every single day and get paid for it? Would I be singing a different tune if I was in their shoes? I'd totally be one of the good ones, you guys. Trust me. Trust me. Remember, with great power comes great responsibility. Now you have an audience, a platform. What you say and how you say it has more influence, but is also constantly under a microscope. There's the added weight of trying to live up to other people's expectations while trying to do things your own way. You're hoping that the audience will trust you moving forward because that's how you got there in the first place. But again, people are silly beans. How secure can you be knowing your continued success is dependent on the whims of an audience and the demands of an algorithm coercing you to make more content to feed the insatiable social media beast? The more you create, the faster an audience could get bored of you. The more arbitrary your work becomes, people begin taking you for granted. If I miss this episode, it's okay because there's gonna be another episode 
forever. On the flip side, people like consistency and can't get enough of their favorite creators. They want more, more, more. You're trying to keep up with this pace to maintain relevancy or because you have bills to pay. However, nobody on earth can consistently make interesting stuff at this pace. We need time to rest, reflect, recharge. The world looks at that notion and goes, nope. YouTube used to be leisure for me, and now it's as if all the hours I could spend consuming content can go towards making it. Being a content creator. Upload one video, and all of a sudden, all those creators you've admired become your peers. Oh, hello. <laughs> knock, knock, it's me, it's imposter syndrome. <laughs> and now you're comparing yourself to everyone else. Can't they tell that you're bullshitting them with your silly editing? How much confidence can you have in your abilities knowing how much of your success is dictated by luck and circumstance? You don't actually deserve any of this. And don't worry, somehow, some way, you'll fuck it up anyways. This whole thing is a sick joke. A viewer could click on, see my face, hear my voice, feel the vibe, and go, nope. Running off to another video while my self-esteem and watch time lives in ruins. You can't take it personally when people don't watch your stuff. It's only entertainment. You won't be as exciting as a dog in the room or duckies at Walmart. Sit down, be humble. All the hours you put into crafting this thing amount to squad douche when a stranger comes along, goes skip, thank you next, and doesn't even care. I know this because I do the exact same thing. And it's the self-awareness that kills me. Being on both sides of the creator audience divide, you develop an immense empathy towards other creators in the space. You understand what goes into the process. You can sense how hard they worked on their projects. The effort is there. Knowing that, I feel guilty when I don't enjoy what other creators produce. Guilty thinking that time spent watching their content could be time spent invested in my own content. Guilty for not contributing my attention or Patreon dollars. Because everybody, everybody has a Patreon. Come on, y'all. I actually did the math on this. Out of the 90s channels I'm subscribed to, four out of five channels have a Patreon. There are so many options. Who do you choose to support? How do you find the mental or emotional bandwidth to engage with all these creators and their content while trying to make content of your own and also having a healthy, well-balanced life in the real world? On top of that, you have to have a social media presence, create and build a community of followers, promote your stuff, network, run a Discord server, and justify your existence. Like, where do you find the time for everything. Life's exhausting as it is. How can I care about everything and everyone when sometimes I barely care for myself, yet I care less for others when I don't take care of myself and I feel like a massive hypocrite, a fraud, a narcissist. I feel selfish for putting my needs ahead of other people. I feel selfish for indirectly asking for your attention. I feel selfish for making content. This is entertainment for you, so pay attention to me. Oh, why? Why? I don't even know what I want anymore. I don't even know who I am anymore. All my interests have been dictated through an algorithm, through the recommendations of others, and through everyone else giving me their opinions. Where do I begin and the content ends? I'm so connected that I'm disconnected, alienated from any idea of the self. <sighs> Nothing seems real anymore. Why do I even want to make content? Why do I even want to watch content? Why do I even want to be here? I have no meaning, no purpose. All this is absurd. There's no reason for anything. I can't laugh about it. I can't cry about it. I can't do anything about it. I don't feel anything. I'm numb. Hey, hey! How's it going? This is an example of a cynical identity absurdist spiral that I go down every time I contemplate the big questions of life and my relationship to the world. It's a bad habit. I have to frame my existential crisis in a way that provides value to you, the viewer. Remember what I said about cynicism getting you nowhere? What's sinister about cynicism is that it eats away at itself, carving out pieces of your soul until you're an emotionless husk walking around all day with brain fog, no clear vision of who you are or what you want to do, completely blank. In these moments, you're clinging on to literally anything to keep you going. Something to get you to that next step. Sometimes getting out of the absurdist funk can be a little thing, just as absurd as what put you down there. We gotta get out of the spiral somehow and build ourselves up. This is brought to you by Tim Hortons.
Luckily, there's a philosophy guy named Thomas Nagel who talks about absurdity. Namely, that the absurd arises from the discrepancy between our subjective experiences of the world and the objective view we can take on it. This is somewhat related to endlessly discussed French boy Albert Camus, who thought that the absurd arises when humankind's desire for reason and unity meets a world that is chaotic, meaningless, random, and the two don't play nice together. But Thomas the Nagel Engine spins that into his own version, because for him, when we take this view and recognize what we do as arbitrary, it does not disengage us from life. And there lies our absurdity. Not in the fact that such an external view can be taken of us, but in the fact that we ourselves can take it, without ceasing to be the persons whose ultimate concerns are so coolly regarded. We are consumed by the act of living. We follow careers, or chase happiness, or cultivate a certain lifestyle. But even in the day-to-day -day heat of this pursuit, we possess a strange meta-capacity to step back and recognize the highly specific nature of the rituals we follow, the arbitrariness of the goals we have. Knowing our purposes would be very different if our circumstances were different, but continuing to follow and pursue them as if they're all important anyway. Basically, we can recognize that there's probably no grandiose meaning to any of this, but we don't act like it, which is actually bananas. We take life very seriously. If you believe that nothing matters, then why does it matter that nothing matters? And if you believe that matters, then clearly something matters to you. Just because life may not have objective meaning, that doesn't mean we can't give it any meaning at all. And just because life is absurd, that doesn't mean we can't strive towards better ways of living. YouTube, and by extension, all of content creation plays into this absurdity because we can recognize that it's all arbitrary. If it's not this piece of content, it's that piece of content constantly cycling through your attention span day by day. If it's not this creator, it's that creator holding the spotlight or fading away into the background. YouTube seems like an ever-present entity that will always be a part of our lives. But it's not. We created the conditions. We invented the rules. All this shit is made up. 20 years ago, YouTube didn't even exist. And now it does. 20 years from now, who knows? Maybe we'll all be microchipped into a collective consciousness and the platform will be obsolete. Everything that occupies our online world is temporary. Nothing is forever. Then what makes, then what makes, then what makes. I mean, shit, look what Elon is doing to Twitter. Despite what the last hour will tell you, when it comes to this whole digital content ecosystem, I still enjoy it. I keep doing it. I keep coming back. Isn't that absurd? This isn't some, oh no, I'm addicted to the dopamine feedback loop kind of thing. I like the internet. I like YouTube. I like watching videos. And I still want to make content. I'm making the content right now. All things considered, YouTube is still pretty good compared to other platforms. However, even if the medium wasn't there, we'd all still be here without it, doing something else, probably, I'd hope. When you strip away all this algorithmic nonsense, what we want is different ways to connect and relate to one another through the act of making cool shit. It's our experiences and the people we share it with that are real. Not a platform, not an algorithm, people, humans. If we post or spend time on a platform, there's got to be meaning to it. We're the ones giving meaning to our existence. But how do we do that? <laughs> According to Viktor Frankl, author of Man's Search for Meaning, not you, <laughs> We all have a will to meaning. It's our desire to find and discover meaning to life and then to go on and fulfill said meaning. The crux of his message is that we find meaning through being attentive to something greater than ourselves, of which the byproduct happens to be self-actualization, transcending suffering, you know, the good shit. If you're paying attention, you can find meaning and give meaning to anything. We find meaning in the small things, the day-to-day -day minutia, acts of kindness, dedication to the next action you take. We find it by simply experiencing elegance in the world without doing or trying to achieve anything. Looking at duckies is great because they're cute and aren't concerned with how many followers they have on social media. They're just little beans being there. Bean. We find meaning through our creative pursuits purely for their own sake. But here, I'm gonna tie that to something deeper, which is finding meaning through experiencing someone else. This may be a bold claim, but there is no one like you in all of existence. You have beautiful little snowflake. Every person is fascinating. And when you experience someone in all their uniqueness, when you give them that loving attention, that compassion, that grace, you see not only their essence, but their potentials as that unique person, making you want to reach out, 
and achieve that potential yourself, whatever that may be. So all these creators, by virtue of who they are and what they do, not only gives you meaning through entertainment, through information, good times, distracting you from the void, but also give you that inspiration to create something yourself, to put out beauty into the world, to generate meaning, to be a better person, etc., etc., etc. Through creating, we self-actualize, and in doing so, other people can see the potential within themselves to do the same. Finding and creating meaning in their lives, which helps everyone else do the same thing. That's amazing. YouTube make me for gore. Creating a video about the framework for creating videos on YouTube is punishing because it's how the platform operates that sucks the life out of the process. When discussing metrics like audience retention or average view duration, it's as if I'm interrogating the experience as I'm experiencing it, constantly overthinking, how do I explain my thoughts in an organized fashion that could also be entertaining for you, the viewer, who is also very cool and very attractive. Yeah, self-awareness is useful but also inhibiting. Looking underneath the hood and studying how YouTubers structure and market their videos, making comparisons between all types of content and the sheer amount of it, the longer you stare into the abyss, the abyss stares back at you. The whole system makes me feel alienated from the work I produce and the fundamental reality of human connection. Somebody should write a book about that. How do you fight the system while being a part of it? How hard do you want to lean on the system to get what you want? I don't like playing these algorithmic games, but if you don't, how can you reach an audience? I don't like being told what to do. I don't wanna be like everyone else. Do we really need another Caucasian male giving their opinions on the internet? I want to rebel against the system by not participating, but in doing so, I deny my voice and all the good associated with it. If I don't speak up, someone else will instead. And who knows what they might say or do? They might create Amazon. And that's why I have to create Amazon. But also, not participating denies me the ability to express and connect with the world. I don't want to tie my mental health to content creation, the roller coaster of social media validation, and I don't want an algorithm to shape who I am. However, when I'm not putting effort into making something and consuming content instead, I become depressed. As the days and months go by without releasing content, irritability, agitation, anxiety are all festering inside. So much so that I don't envy other creators' material successes I envy their ability to do anything and all the fan art they receive. Hey, could that frustration be proof of a will to meaning? Because through doing so, we find and create meaning for ourselves and for others. Victor Frankl, you son of a bitch. I can't care about others unless I care about myself and that feels fucking selfish. So ironically, I end up losing myself in other people at my own expense and that feels bad too, which makes me want to cut myself off from all these feelings, all these people, everything. And I hate that too, which makes me feel even worse sending me into the cynical depression spiral. But deep down, it's just fear. It's always fear. There's a confidence side to me that goes, I dedicated myself and gave 100%, I could kill it at this YouTube shit. And a pessimistic side that responds, Shut up, that's ego. There's no such thing as greatness. It's all luck and arbitrary. But the root of that is fear. Growing up, I'd either be bullied for who I was or ashamed for my interests. So I'd be afraid of going after what I really wanted. Any personal accomplishment felt like something people wanted from me or was expected of me. And that never felt satisfying because I wanted something else. Something more. I'm literally a Disney princess. I never had something to call my own that I felt proud of. I'm afraid because I've never gotten recognition for something that feels like me. And now, with this YouTube experience, the prospect of having something I care about morph into something else terrifies me. I'm afraid of losing the joy that comes with creation. I'm afraid of bending to the systemic influence of an online ecosystem. I'm afraid of having my motivation shift and what that means for my personal identity. I think I'm afraid of everything. I'm afraid of change. Afraid of the unknown. Afraid I'll abandon everything I've ever loved. Afraid I'll abandon everything I will love. Afraid that's a lie and I'm incapable of loving anything. I'm afraid of intimacy. I'm afraid of vulnerability. I'm afraid of being rejected for who I am. I'm afraid that I'm wasting my time. Afraid time is passing me by. Afraid of trying only to fail again. Afraid of what I can achieve. Afraid of what success might do to me. Afraid I'll become bitter and stuck in mediocrity. Afraid that it'll never be good enough. Afraid that this YouTube thing won't work out for anyone. We're currently at the end of this pandemic era of YouTube, 
where many creators came into the space, building their profiles and blowing up in a short period of time. Seems like there's opportunities everywhere on this site, and yet also the dark ages of YouTube, apparently. <laughs> the concept of time has been so weird the past few years. Living on this earth, the vibes have felt a bit off. With the world opening up, I'm curious about its effects on the content landscape. We don't know where it's going, how demands will change, or how content will evolve. It's safe to say that anyone who tells you that YouTube or whatever platform will be dead in five years is full of shit. Yet, at the same time, endless growth seems unsustainable. If the numbers get so big, do they mean anything anymore? C can they do that? Maybe we'll usher in an era of content utopia, or advance towards a technological singularity, and Deveva style. Let's merge our algorithms. When it comes to being on this platform, the one thing you have to remember is you don't have to do any of this. Nobody is forcing you to be here. You don't have to watch any more YouTube videos. You don't have to make any more YouTube videos. There are other creative outlets. Have you, have you tried reading books? Have you tried making Sonic fan art? Between uploading and publishing my last video, there was a two-week gap where I considered what would happen if I never hit public and just stopped. Hell, I filmed a two-hour video where I went brain-dead watching nine ContraPoints videos at the same time, and I never published it. Any video could be your last. And this could end unceremoniously. Creators come and go, or move on to other avenues beyond YouTube. But that's the way it is with everything, right? Just like I have to consider the impermanence of the platform, the creators, my very existence, I also have to consider my impermanence towards these feelings, and let go. Because all these doubts, all the self-awareness, all this YouTube systemic shit, they get you nowhere and stifle your creativity. Why do you want to do this? Why do you want to create? What is your why as a creator? You can have a completely arbitrary mixture of various motivations, that's fine. But you gotta be honest with it. Otherwise you'll lose sight of yourself and end up where I'm at. In Cartesian hermit monk mode, completely disconnected from the rest of society. While we can be in conflict with the world, oftentimes the conflict comes from within. But when it's quiet and I'm left to contemplate who I am, going deeper inside, there are no clear answers. There's a void. Sometimes it's like, I don't know why people do things. What compels them? Why do they have ambition? Why do they care? And why can't I find those emotions? Oh my god, who hurt you? Was it Rene Descartes? That bastard? Regardless, when everything vanishes and there's just a void, all that's left in my being is a will to live. The indomitable human spirit. I have no control over this. What the fuck? I just want to be alive and vibe. Is that all there is to it? From this will comes my desire to do. I want to express myself. I want to connect to others. I want to give love and receive love. I want to be seen. I want to be needed. I want to feel purpose. I want to have an impact. I want to give a shit. I want to matter. I want to matter. I'm so sick of this apathy. I'm so sick of this fear. I am so sick of tearing myself down at every opportunity. I'm so sick of this envy for other people courageously pursuing their ambitions. I'm so sick of wondering how different life would be if you actually believed in yourself. I'm so sick of suppressing my will to live. Why did I make this video? Why did I make this video? I did it for the sexual thrill. Why did I make this video? I wanted to see if I could do it. I like the idea of this video existing. Whenever I think I'm burnt out on YouTube, along comes a video that expresses exactly how I'm feeling or provides a different perspective on the world that unlocks something in my brain, rejuvenating my life force. You feel less alone looking out and seeing people riding the same vibe you're on. And in the moments when your authenticity lines up with their vibes, when someone sees you or your creation and goes, pure magic. I go by the philosophy that you make the art or the content you wish you wanted, and perhaps you show people something they never knew they wanted. Yeah, I like the validation of getting notifications, but it's your comments and feedback that makes this real. I do this to prove I'm not alone. I do it to keep the inner child alive, and as a beacon for any version of myself to come, like being an audience of one. I wanted to prove that I could traverse through the darkest parts of my psyche and come out the other side better for it. A reminder that just how you can give compassion and hope to yourself you can do the same for others. Helping someone else dealing with similar issues be able to navigate their path or get them through a rough patch because we need each other to overcome our struggles. And maybe through giving love to others, you can find the love you can't give yourself and learn to love again. Even if this whole existence is completely absurd, nothing matters, it's all arbitrary, blah, blah, blah. 
You have to believe in yourself. You have to believe in yourself. There is no other option. Keep trying, keep doing. Do you know how many times over the past few months I've sat at my computer trying to get these thoughts out only to end up curled up in a ball of self-loathing and anxiety on my bed hating myself, wondering whether I'm gonna finish this goddamn video, wondering if it's still even worth it, wondering whether I can make anything. I'm still here. I still wrote this. Like, I, st I still made the video. Get up, keep trying, you can do it. It's not impossible. You can keep moving forward. You have more power than you think. It's gonna be scary and hard, but you owe it to yourself to give a fuck about anything. I could have given up. I wanted to give up. I'm sitting here at my desk typing these words in a frenzy, frustrated that I can't get this first stink in a paragraph across the finish line while blasting sad boy music. I kept coming back because this is a journey. It's the challenge of doing the work, overcoming adversity, and trying the best you can at any given moment. As Veritasian puts it, paradoxically, you have to believe that you are in control of your own destiny, even though you know it's not true. I'm so nervous about releasing an intimate video where I'm confronting all my deep-seated anxieties, not knowing how it'll be received, and even now, still doubting whether I have anything worth saying. Video's getting done either way. It's coming out. Because doing nothing feels way worse than whatever fears you may have. I don't want to leave this life left on red. There's something beautiful about going through all these doubts, thinking they can be resolved, and living in spite of them. The true act of rebellion is not to withdraw from the world, but to embrace it. The universe can be cruel and indifferent. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Acknowledge the fear and the uncertainty and carry on. Keep going you'll get somewhere and even if it seems hopeless even if you feel worthless and even if you don't have a purpose please be kind to yourself even if it doesn't love you back love yourself yeah, I know this is very similar to other areas I've talked about before. Others have probably put it more succinctly than me. Whatever, I know it's all been done, but I'll do it anyways. Because no matter how many times you hear it, it still feels good for someone to say, I love you. Taste and love pill. Also, I need to finish this video and expunge it from my box. So why do anything? Because you're alive. It's all the things our homie Viktor Frankl said about meaning. If you're wondering how a script about the YouTube platform ended up in psychoanalysis, well, being a human being is hard sometimes. We have to deal with these assholes, which may exacerbate your inner demons, making it harder to do art or connect with the world. Just try not to lose sight that we're all sharing this existence and we're all connected to one another through everything. That piece of art slash art experience becomes a part of you, which is then propelled through the vessel of your being onto something else. I am a part of your day, a day which is a part of your life. You can become a part of mine by leaving a comment down below and subscribing. Yeah. Like, this isn't only about content creation. Sharing life with people in this brief time that we're alive, doing that is sufficient enough. Same with me being here, same with you being here. You are enough. You're not great because of what you produce. You're great. Period. Your value comes from being you. Even if it's all forgotten eventually, at least we had this time together. At least we can smile and laugh about it together. We're all temporary. Appreciate this for what it is and let it pass through your life. You're fine. We're all fine. It's okay for you to be here. I like that you're here. And we could spend this moment together. As for the future, who knows? Maybe there's a future where I stop posting and wonder what could have been. Maybe there's a future where I waste away mediocrity and end up a bitter, cynical failure. Maybe there's a future where I succeed. Maybe I'm wrong in my approach. Maybe I need a bit of community. Maybe I need a simp army for the kingdom of Zatsmania. Maybe I need a little economic incentive. Maybe I need a little something to look forward to. Maybe I just need to believe in myself. Maybe I can be happy. Maybe it's okay for me to be here. I am me. I want to be myself. I want to keep existing in this world. My life is worth living here. Okay. I don't want to turn to Mr. Beast. 
Mentos, the fresh maker.